Well, let's, let's start by talking about uh, your experiences with the with the Dankworth band. What was it, 56? I joined in 55, I think, yeah, October 55. You followed Alan Ganley? Yes. Well, it, I just, just, the whole band changed, you know. Yeah. I think about nine people all left at once. Mm. And uh, the whole character of the band changed because of this, you know. Uh, at the time I joined it, uh, it was really like a big Dixieland band. Uh, John really is... Mm. Uh, his roots are in mm. Dixieland. I mean, most of his uh, youth was playing around... Freddie Murfield. Freddie Murfield, exactly. Garbage I mean, we, we come from the same area. We actually went to school together, yeah. only... Uh, that was I've got to say I think, that I'm it? younger than yeah. him. <laughs> and he didn't used to speak to me too much. <laughs> Which he does at school, do you? you know? <laughs> young is bad at school. Um, later, young is marvellous. <laughs> anyway, um, so it was really like a Dixieland band, except that instead of one trombone, there was four. And in one trumpet, there was four trumpets, etc., etc. Mm. But, but the writing was basically like a Dixieland band. Mm. And uh, it was very uh, confining from a rhythm section point of view because you played like eight bars of two in the bar, then eight bars of four in the bar, mm. then eight bars of one in the bar, and then went boom, 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 boom. It was really like that, you know, and, and I wasn't a particular mm. fan of that kind of playing. So uh, what we really did was to change the style of the band dramatically. So uh, we had a few David Lindup charts, which we played very well because they were mm. bassy type yeah, things, yeah. you know. And then we didn't play the other ones too well. Mm. <laughs> and finally John decided to cut some of those mm. things out and he started to write in the same kind of idiom that suited the band, which is, of course, naturally right. Have you um, any favourite uh, tracks from that period at all, that, that, that band? Anything that you were very fond of? I used to like one, one you did called Hullabaloo. Oh, I remember that, that yeah. That was a good one. That was after he introduced the seven... Yeah, well, that also line, happened yes. during that period. You know, yeah. After the band had been going about a year and a half, I think he decided he wanted something mm. a bit different. Because John is very creative that way, he never wants to stand still. And so that's when he decided to make the front line, instead of a saxophone section, a seven, the original seven, but written yeah. as the saxophone section. And it worked very well. Yeah. One of my favourite records, fine enough, was the thing called Indiana, which we did very early on, just after I joined the band. Was that on disc? It was only on a 78. Ah, but the thing yeah. about it was it was good ensemble playing with great dynamics, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and uh, I really enjoyed that one. I mean, I haven't heard it for a hundred years. I never heard that one, actually. I really? thought I had all those old parlophone records. Oh, it's up in my loft somewhere with <laughs> dust, probably in about 17 pieces by now. <laughs> yeah, good. I, I love that band. I always remember you, you a, a quote by you at the time. You remember when he used to break the band down? He had the Dickie Horton quintet. And That's he had right, the yeah. Laurie Laurie you always said you were the worst small band drummer in the world. Well, oh, this know? is true, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know when that changed. I mean, I was petrified about yeah. playing with small bands because yeah. I felt very kind of loud and clumsy and, and mm. really very bad about mm. it. And we'd always played like at the, the Flamingo or something with the band or the Marquee, and there'd be uh, like Tommy Whistle Squintet, with Jackie Doom mm. and Sally Marvels in the little band, or Tony Kinsey, and I felt really clumsy. And I don't know when it changed, funnily enough. I remember I did some clinics with Joe Morello, and, uh, which we used to get on very well together. But when he got angry at me, which you do sometimes mm. when you're doing drum battles yeah, with each yeah, other, yeah. he used to say, you can't play quiet that can, it's always too loud, too loud. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw Joe a few weeks ago, and I said, Joe, I finally can play quiet. He said, great. <laughs> How is Joe? Is he how the how eyes? Is yeah. he completely blind now, or can he still see? No, it? but he's got a guide dog and everything, he? and yeah. yeah, and he really needs it. And he still can still yeah. play, obviously. Yeah. Oh, oh sure, yeah. yeah. Chops. He's yeah. never going to lose that. Amazing. Man. It's amazing. It's a shame that he doesn't come out. In fact, he was really keen to come over to Europe uh, to put some kind of little group together, you mm. know. But he's a little worried in case nobody remembers him. Oh, silly. <laughs> well, there you are. Still a name. <laughs> well, then uh, let, let's go on then from from the Dankworth band. Um, what were you? With? How long were you there? Five years. Was it really? Yeah. yeah. Then he sm he smalled the band down, didn't he? I remember about 60, 61. <coughs> Dudley Moore was in the band. Well, and I think Peter once King. we played the Newport Jazz Festival, I think he felt that band had reached its peak. Mm. And we also did a week with Duke's band, which was to change a lot of things for all of us. You know, in my particular case, I played with the band, and it changed my entire mm -hmm. conception about music. Mm -hmm. uh, not changed, but confirmed some and changed others. Um, so when we came back, I think we did a tour with Sarah Vaughan around England and Scotland, and uh, when that was over, the band packed up. And he reformed the band uh, in a different style. He wanted a band more like Duke's band, where everybody was a soloist. Mm -hmm. But it didn't, for me, work out too well, uh, and I was never really that happy with that band. It got much better when I left. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it really did, you know. Yeah, yeah. I quite like that band, actually. I thought, you know, Dickie was still there, wasn't he? Kenny Wheeler was in. That's right, yeah. 
But in all fairness, Dickie wasn't a first trumpet no, player, no. and it wasn't his fault that, that Derek Abbott decided not to come back at the last minute. So Dickie helped out on the first trumpet until they could find somebody, and I'd left before they found mm. somebody. And Gus, there was Gus Galbraith too, I seem to No, he'd there. left by then. Had no. he? It, yeah. Another song. I remember the band in the Theatre Royal here in, in Dublin. And Dudley Moore was in that band. I remember Danny Moss was in yes, the band. Yes, Dudley, yeah. Dudley and Spike Heatley. Spike Heatley, that's right. It's a long way. We've got 60. Ian McDougall. That's right. Who's now in the Rob first trumpet player with yeah. Boss for us. Oh, that's a beautiful band. I know, yeah. Can't remember the other trumpet player. Could have been Gus Galbraith. Gus Galbraith was certainly in Dublin with him, but I don't... He, when well, you he came the next time... Yes, it was Gus, you're right. You had Eddie Harvey on piano, I remember. No, I'd left by then, but, but Dudley no, was still doing it when I left. Was yeah. he? Yeah, yeah. And Bobby Breen was singing. Yes, right, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm only a drool. What was the story, the famous story? <laughs> oh, yeah, that was it. Yeah, I can't remember the story. <laughs> he died, didn't he? Yes, yeah, he did, yeah. Side, yeah. Yeah, shame. So what happened then after, after the Danquist band? <coughs> well, was the that whole thing was that, that during the period, the six-week period, when the band changed over, the, the new band started, um, I just happened to pick up a, t a Perry Como TV show, yeah. which at the time was the hottest show in the world. You know, I mean, it was like uh, everybody watched on Friday night or whenever it was yeah. on. And uh, he came, he was, had so many fans in England that they decided to come and do one show from London. And the BBC uh, were going to use their usual Eric Robinson band. And about a week before the gig came along, they suddenly realised they must have heard a couple of shows. Mm -hmm. And the rhythm section for the uh, for the American band was Bob Haggart and Don Lamond oh, and right. uh, Dick Hyman. I can't remember the guitar player, Barry Galbraith or something. You know, they they thought they'd better get uh, a bit more modern rhythm section that was currently working for Eric Robinson. So they they inquired around all the kind of hot drummers in town, and they couldn't. It was a whole week, and they couldn't do it all. And I was the only guy that could do the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I got the gig. And of course it changed everything. I mean, you couldn't have got a better introduction to the studio work than to go into the most important TV show Absolutely. at that particular time. Yeah, yeah. So all of a sudden the phone never stopped ringing. I was yeah. getting all kinds of work. You know, within a week I was doing a TV show with Gordon McRae, then mm. Eartha Kitt, and you know, all of a sudden mm. I was a kind of a hot studio thing. You did quite a few of the big singers, didn't you, like Silla Black and... Oh yeah, 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 the yeah I've done a lot of those hit records at yeah, that time. Yeah. Yeah. I did that for roughly seven years before I actually got a chance to get out and play again, which was yeah. the Kenny Clark's band. Yeah. And once I got to that, I thought, now this is what I joined for mm. in the first mm. place, and mm. uh, not to really play uh, behind Silver sort of Black, and e even though it's very exciting at the time, you know, when, when you get involved in it, it's great, but it wasn't really playing-wise mm. what mm. I wanted to do. It's always been said, a lot of people have said it to me, that they felt that that, that single that you did with Leffitt's Gerald was a bit of a milestone for you. Can't buy me love. Do you, would you it was a that? milestone in so much as yeah. drummers decided to find out who was on it. Mm. And, uh, I, and it was only years later that I got the feedback from it at yeah. the time. It yeah. was just a nice record yeah. and I was very yeah. pleased. I still got a copy of it. So I. Don't play it, but I still <laughs> got one. And uh, I remember years, about three years later, I went to Hollywood and called up Jack Sperling, who I'd always been mm -hmm. quite a fan of, you know, and I just to kind of ask where he was playing, I could go and see him. Mm -hmm. And when he said, uh, he said, who's this? I said, who I was. And he said, oh, he said, well, where are you playing? I want to come and hear you. So mm -hmm. I said, how do you know about me? He said, the Ella Fitzgerald the record. record yeah. And he, yeah. he actually wrote to EMI in London to find out who it was. Did you, were there in fact any more tracks than just those two? Because I don't think they ever came out, not to my No, there wasn't, no. The Swedish uh, Sounds, I think, was the was, other thing. Uh, yes, Swedish Sounds. They were the only two mm. things like that. We did People, oh, Mac the Knife, but oh. uh, not Mac the Knife, um, a real miserable tune to play on. Hello, Dolly. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's nothing you can do with that. No. So, what, th what then? Well, then you I started big to get though, into jazz yeah, things, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, Fortunately, but once, once I started working with Kenny Clark's band, mm -hmm. I started to meet a whole new bunch of people. And I started to come to do a lot of records with the MPS in Germany. I became so much so that it became like I was on everything for a mm -hmm. while, and uh, like, finally I had to call that because it wasn't fair to everybody else. Mm -hmm. But during that period, I worked with Joe Pass, with uh, Monty Alexander, um, Stefan Grappelli, the accordion player, Art Van Damme. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And they were lovely, mm -hmm. very, very enjoyable mm -hmm. days. Yeah, Milt mm -hmm. Buckner, the, the things oh, I did yeah. with Milt, I okay. still, okay. they're the ones I play when I've had yeah. a couple of drinks and yeah. want to kind of yeah. reminisce a bit, you know, because yeah. they were really happy things. Such a lovely man. Yeah. He's died, he's dead, I think. Yes, he did, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think the only records I have of him have Joe Jones on them. The trio stuff that he well, did. Well, Joe and him were, were very close. They've been together for yeah. years, you know. Yeah. And the only reason I got to, to work with him was because uh, we were doing a jazz festival in Cologne, and then Pierce decided to record Milt, who was there as a single, mm. and Jimmy Woody was there, who was also playing oh, yeah. the bass on the original Beautiful. ones, and so I was the uh, kind of available drummer mm. to do it. Mm. And after that, I don't think he ever worked with Joe again, except with Illinois when they did the trio mm. with the organ, uh, piano, and uh, organ, drums, and tenor. Mm. But uh, so we did a tour and everything, uh, Jimmy Woody and uh, Milton and I. Oh, lovely voice, man. Which was, yeah. couldn't stop laughing, mm. but the minute we yeah. got to work, the yeah. minute we left. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> beautiful. Beautiful people yeah. being. What about the Tony Bennett episode? Was that after that, after that uh, sort of period? Well, that was the next period. The next thing that happened was the Tom Jones tour. Oh, <laughs> Which was telling me about that. Yes, it was an incredible <laughs> experience, though. You know, it was real being, for the first time in my life, a superstar, you yeah, know, where yeah. I've got somebody to carry the drums, set yeah. them up, carry me if necessary. <laughs> the only time it's ever happened. Yeah. But musically, it was great. I mean, Tom was marvellous. Uh, whatever shape he was in uh, during the day, you know, whatever he did, if he drank too much or whatever else he might have done, uh, on the gig, he was always in perfect shape for it. If he had to go and sit in the sauna for two hours, he'd mm. do it. As long as he could sing, that was the mm. most important thing mm. to him. And anybody that does that, you have to do the same thing yourself. If they, if they think that much of the gig, then you must do it too. And even though musically it was a, certainly the hardest and loudest gig mm. I've ever done, mm. uh, I loved every minute of it. Cause and he, he was still he's a such a performer voice. and he, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. So who was that? Was, was Johnny Spence? Yes, he was, yes. A great uh, band, yeah. Bobby Shue was on the band. Was and, he? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Really excellent band. And Derek Watkins went with you, did he? No, no, no. Oh. Bobby Shue was uh, the first oh, I see. Player. Yeah. So who, did you, who else went with you? Uh, oh, uh, Jim Sullivan and John Rustle were the only oh, two yeah. musicians. Yeah, yeah. So then after that was Tony Bennett then? After that yeah. was Tony, yeah. Mm. Which and was that, lovely. That started as a tele television show in England, I think? Was well, the Bob thing Farley? was, I, I did a... Uh, just before I left to go on the Tom Jones tour, I did a concert at the Albert Hall with Tony and the mm -hmm. RPO, the LPO, I can't remember which, and Bob Farnan, which was a great success for Tony, you know, they, uh, they televised it and they recorded it and the album sold well and he did a tour in England on the strength of that, yeah. but I couldn't do it, I was still away with Tom, but when they came back did an album, and uh, Ronnie Verrill did the tour and I did one date of the album and Ronnie did the other two and... Uh, Tony asked me if I'd do the TV series with him. And it was due to that that I couldn't do the next Tom Jones tour because I overlapped. Yeah. And so uh, Tony said, well, come with me to the States. I said, okay, fine. So, but I should have gone to live there because the commuting took all the money yeah. and yeah. nearly killed me too. But I became an expert. I should really open the travel agents. <laughs> I could get from anywhere to anywhere <laughs> on my own. Yeah. Because they treated me like an American musician. Yeah. They just say, oh, the yeah. next gig uh, is in somewhere other in Chicago, uh, three o'clock sound check. And that was the only information I got. I had to get there myself. Did you do many albums? Probably? Quite a few, yeah. yeah. Yeah, some good ones too. And John Bunch was there the whole time. I think you said no. Late John Bunch was when I joined, mm, and yeah. uh, most of the albums I did, John was on. Mm. There was one trio track. Do you ever hear that, Mimi? No. Oh, that's nice. Good ones there. Yeah, yeah, and cute. We did cute and Mimi at the end of a session one time. You know, one take of each. Ran it down once and played it once, and it's nice. Very good. Yeah, yeah. nice. I don't know which album it's on. Yeah. Yeah. And then Bernie Layton came. Bernie Layton yeah. after that, and then Torrey Zito. Oh, yeah. He, uh, Ronnie Zito's brother? brother? Yeah. 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 That's the name we don't hear now. Well, he came to Europe, Ro I think, didn't he? Ronnie Zito. Ronnie? No, Ronnie. Ronnie's uh, quite a pretty heavy player in New York. Really? Yeah, he's quite a heavy studio player. What little studio work I only know him from, from his thing with Woody after Jake Hanna left, you know. Oh, no, he, he does very well, mm. Ronnie. He does a lot of work, yeah. Mm. He's a good player, too, a fine player. In fact, the last time I saw Ronnie was in Bermuda. We did an IBM convention, and Walt Levinsky brought a band down from New York, for Tony, funny enough. Mm. And I was there with Cleo, and uh, and the rhythm section for them was Derek Smith, Ronnie Zito, and George oh. Rivier. Couldn't get any good players. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Derek Smith seems to be doing very well. Oh, yeah, well, Derek's a fantastic a good player. player yeah. oh, beautiful. I remember him in the old days when I was a kid. I used to go to concerts. In fact, the last time I heard uh, Derry Smith was on um, a Bill Watrous album, Big Band. That's right, yeah. yeah. Which is very good, which had the drummer called Ron Brown on it, I think. It had been also with Woody at some stage. Well, when I saw that on. band, I can't remember the name of the drum. I know him very Ed well. Ed did a couple of albums too with the band, so there'd been a few people, yeah. obviously. So it's, I think it's a basically a rehearsal band. Ronnie right? Davis was the guy that I, I saw with the band that was also with Woody. Ronnie Davis, you're right, absolutely. That's in fact, when, Brown, with, with, with Tony, we worked with Woody's band a lot, you know, and yeah. uh, so I, I got to see Ron a lot. Good player too. And the thing I loved about Brian was that he wouldn't, he left John because John wouldn't pay for the bass on the airplane. 
Really? He said, you know, mainly it's a bass guitar gig, and really you could do the whole thing on a bass guitar, which you can do. I mean, in all fairness, I mean, the amount of uh, boom, 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 boom tunes yeah. we play is negligible to the amount of dawn, do long, doing things. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but he said, no, I'm, I want to be a string bass player. I play the bass guitar and I do it very well, but I don't want to play it. Quite right. So I'll leave. Right. Yeah. Quite right. Which was marvellous. Yeah, I didn't know he played with, with John. Yeah, oh, we did it. It was three years. The reception was Paul and Brian yeah, and I, yeah. yeah. It was lovely, too. I did a jingle for Paul Hart the other night. Pardon? I did a jingle for Paul Hart the other night. Did you? For, um, for Bailey's Cream. Oh, I do a lot of jingles for Paul. He's very good, isn't he? Oh, excellent. He's, very He's good. a fantastic He's musician. Good. Fantastic guy, too. Mm. He's got one bit of nastiness in him at all. No, he's a real... Doesn't know the name of the word. Yeah. Lovely well, now that Danny's sitting with us, tell us what you think of the pizza band. <laughs> <laughs> well, now Danny's with us, I can't. <laughs> uh, Danny and I go back a long way. I know you do, yeah. We were you, serving you... for uh, King and Country together. Yeah. Were you, yeah. indeed? Yes. By Joe. At RAF Innsworth. Passion oh, Dale. Yeah. Almond Tears. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. When we, I think the best thing is when we relieve Mafeking. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we were kids together. Yeah. We joined Oscar Aitken's band again. Yeah. Well, I joined his uh, we, oh, The only band I was in that you weren't was um, Jack's band. That's right. Every other band I've ever been in, at some time you've shown up or at some yeah. time I've shown up. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get away from you. No, well, you went with, with Ted's band when, when Danny was there, were you? No, no, no. no, no. no. The, the time I went with Ted was long after all of that. Mm. In fact, I was there the night he had the, uh, the tumour. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 And at the time, he was sick. I didn't know he was that sick. I was quite relieved because I was late. <laughs> and Ted was very nasty about being late. Like we got called yeah. in the races at Newport or something, and uh, we couldn't get across. We were playing in Cardiff. Yeah. And, oh, at uh, Chepstow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, little bridge at Chepstow. Yeah. A funny little town full of people for the races. And we were sitting in the car steaming, Ruddy Chamberlain, Johnny Edwards and I. And we got there late, and Ted wasn't there. We couldn't believe it. Our luck, you know. We got there at eight, we're on at eight. And we got all the stuff together, and suddenly Ted came in looking terrible, you know. Yeah. He couldn't go on. I mean, he went straight to Oscar. Yeah. Lovely man, wasn't he? Right. Ted was fantastic. Yeah. So anyway, you went, you went back with, with, with John and Cleo. Yeah, I ran into them and I did a finally, I did this thing in New York at Carnegie Hall with just one night and then mm. after that when they got back to England I started working with them yeah. and I've been basically with them ever since. But it's only a, you know, a three months and a year yeah. job, we don't work all the time. Yeah. Well how did the, the, the pizza band come around? Did it just come out of a gig and held together or? Well, I, how I got in it, I don't really know. Uh, I didn't really work much at the pizza and I, I suddenly started to do the odd thing there. I did a thing with Peter Rind and who was that American piano player? Oh, Roger Kellaway. Roger Kellaway, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah and uh, with Al Cohn. Yeah. And uh, Peter Boise was there, and all of a sudden I was one of his boys, you know. Yeah. Which you was got fantastic. In, yeah. Oh, did I? Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. Well, we, yeah, it, was a, it, was, it picked itself, the band, actually. Oh, it did? Oh. That's good. It's a fine band when yeah. the whole band is yeah. there. It's, uh, it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Strong band. Yeah. Well, this is your. The real personnel that you have mm. on yeah. this trip, yeah. You've got yeah. the A1 team here, yeah. Now, yeah. yeah. There's only been one chain, and Digby left, didn't he? Digby yeah. Fairweather left, and Colin yeah. Smith came in. That's been the only official change. Yeah. And it's just the one record so far? Just the one record, yeah. About time we did another one, Yes, I think so, yeah. We should do a live one, because I thought the, uh, the mix could have been done a lot better. I remember at the time we listened to the playbacks, and with a bottle of wine, I got quite drunk with the excitement about it all. Mm. When I finally heard the record, I was a little bit disappointed. Well, that happens a lot, though, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it does, yeah. 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 But in the studio situation, they can do that, too. Oh, yeah. But if it's live, they can't. Then, of course, there's the transfer from um, tape to disc as well. Yeah. There's a bit of a loss. Mm -hmm. Though I say they can't. I remember doing an album live with Liza Minnelli and Judy Garland at the Palladium, and the playback sounded sensational. But the, the, when they sent the tapes back to the States, the record company they decided it sounded more like a studio thing mm. with dubbed applause. So, so they, they tried to they make it... Wrote, oh, God. Messed it up to so where it sounded awful. Make it sound They mixed it down. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's down. terrible. <laughs> well, so what else is there, we can say? Well, I don't know. I'm one you of the few drummers in the world that's played with... I, th I think I've played with more drummers than any other drummer that I know because I did a whole bunch of clinics years ago with Joe Morello. Yeah. Then I did a, a couple of clinics with Max Roach and Art Taylor. Then I did some clinics with Philly Joe and Kenny Clark. And one, yeah. uh, then I did one with Les Demurl. Then I did a whole bunch with Louis Belson. 
And then we did yeah. the album, yeah. Buddy Louie and oh, I. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I got to sit on a bandstand with an audience with more drummers than any other drummer I've ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. oh, also, like Bobby Rosengarten. Uh, yeah. And Jack. Jack Parnell, oh, yeah, that's when it started, yeah. And of course, Kenny Clark with all those years on that band. But it's fun playing with other yeah, drummers. Yeah, yeah. I'm it's sure really, it's another actually, situation. Yeah. You learn a lot very quickly, <laughs> or you get wiped out. I don't. I, that guy you play with today, Desi, I've done it with him. Yeah, he's a good player. Playing written stuff because he's a good reader. Is he? Yeah. Oh. I wrote a few things out between the two. We did. We, did that. we used to do a feature, a, a rocky thing. He is actually a, a very good rock drummer. He's is a good it? session player. Yeah. I also work with Danny Humbea, who plays fantastic. Oh, yeah, marvelous player. Yeah. We did an album with four drummers. That was a. A mess. <laughs> oh, yes. I that. that was, was a Klaus Weiss, thing, Germany's Buddy Rich. Um, Not quite. A guy called Todd Kennedy and myself. But, but we did it nice. We played like if, if uh, I think, uh, but whatever soloists played, we all played behind them at different times, you know. Mm -hmm. and it worked out, very, it became very interesting. Yeah, yeah. What about, I know drummers, people ask me who my favourites are, I just say, I like it, you know, I like everybody, but you must have influences, I think. Any particular influences? Well, well obviously the first influence was Buddy Rich, but it took me about three weeks to realise I was ever going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so then I started to listen to a lot of other people, you know, mm -hmm. like, for example, people that I really loved, it was Don Lamont mm -hmm. for big bands, uh, Sid Catlett, mm -hmm. um, Joe Jones, uh, George Wetland, mm -hmm. uh, Cliff Lehman, Frank Carson, mm -hmm. those kind of drums yeah, were the drummers yeah. I was listening Chick to. Webb, you listen to Chick Webb, you listen to Chick Webb, Pardon? Listen to Chick Webb. I n never found too much of Chick <laughs> Webb, that was just a bit after I started. I mean, yeah. I, when I got into listening to music, it was during the war, and records weren't that uh, easily available. Mm -hmm. And I never managed to find anything of Chick Webb that was really, where you could really hear what he did. You know, everybody that, that yeah. ever saw him said he was fantastic. Mm. I mean, Buddy mm. raves about him. Mm. And Gene Krupa, of course. Mm. I mean, I, I still love Gene for what he did. It was, was incredible. And then at the a very early age, really? I started to listen to Kluke and to, to Max and Roy Haynes because I was still very young and very uh, influenced by what was going on new, just like the kids are today. You know, they mm. want to hear today's music. Mm. So a whole bunch of influences, obviously. But the thing I've always felt is that all those people, any time they joined a band, you notice the difference. Mm. And that's what I've always tried to do as mm. well, you know, mm. to make something a little bit different to what's been done before. Hopefully better, not always, mm. but mm. hopefully. <laughs> do you find you can still be influenced? I mean, like, listen to, you know, you see and hear Steve Gadd and people like this and Harvey Mason, because I mean, oh, you're probably not playing that type of music yeah, so much. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I had yeah. a, a real come down a, a few months ago. I was working at Ronnie's with Milt Jackson, yeah. and uh, one night Jack DeJanette came in. Yeah. Now he played on my drums, playing the same tunes I was playing, and he played them completely different mm. and completely Jack to Jeanette, mm. you know. Now, mm. I was playing the whole gig trying to be like a bebop drummer playing in, in Milk Jackson's bag. Mm. No pun intended yeah. there. Yeah. And Very good. Uh, was doing that okay, you know. I mean, I was sitting there, Milk was happy, and all of a sudden this guy comes in and plays it completely different, completely off the wall for what Milk Jackson, I would have thought Milk Jackson would, would like. And he loved it. He thought really? it was marvelous. Yeah, yeah. It made him think a different way, you yeah, know. Yeah. Suddenly the guy wasn't accompanying him, he was giving him a battle, and he kind yeah. of got in there and fought back, and the music was incredible. Mm. That's the one thing I've never been able to do, is to dominate anything. I've always, whatever situation I'm in, I try to accompany in the way that I think those people want to accompany. Whereas a lot of drummers nowadays don't do that, and even though I'm not always agreeing with that kind of mm. thing, I find that I just cannot do it. I know a lot of players, like Louis, Louis Stewart, he likes people to play against him. Against him, him yes. I find that, I difficult find that very it. difficult to do, mm. but I can do it with some people. I can do it with that young tenor player, Richie, because he plays that way. Mm. Oh. I just got absolutely arseways across him. Yeah. It sounds very exciting, you know, when you yeah. hear it back. Yeah, I can do it in but certain circumstances. I, don't know I like doing it. Now, for example, if I'm working with Ronnie Scott's quintet, yeah. I play a lot different yeah. to what I'm working yeah. with this yeah. band. Yeah. I don't consciously yeah. approach it that yeah. way, but it just comes out different. Yeah.